Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think I need to tell you that Dragon Ball is probably one of the most influential animes there ever was. And when it comes to Dragon Ball Z in this video, we're going to talk about the big arcs of this series. Just so you know, we're going to cover over the Saiyan Saga arc, the Planet Namek Saga arc, the Cell Saga arc, which is also the Android arc, and finally the Boo Saga arc. So before we get started, let me know what your favorite arc is of Dragon Ball Z. And if you do like this type of content, show some love to the channel by liking and maybe hitting the subscribe button. Now then, let's get started. Now then, before we get into our first arc, which would be the Saiyan Saga arc, I should prefacize something. If you never watched the original Dragon Ball series, this series is specifically about Son Goku, a Saiyan that was from another planet that they set free because they needed to save him from Lord Frieza. And at first, a lot of characters believed that Goku could have conquered Earth if he wanted to. However, he grew up being a character that protects the Earth as well as found love here and had a son. Now the Dragon Ball series arc is something great that we could cover in another day. But just so we're all clear, at this point of the story, Goku's now older, is also married, and has his son. Now within the Saiyan Saga arc, we get three new bad guys for this arc. The first villain that we see is really a character we should have seen a lot more. During the beginning of this arc, we get to see the first pure Saiyan that's not Goku. Interesting enough, this Saiyan is named Raddus. The reason this is interesting is because this is legitimately Goku's real brother. Once Raddus was able to get to Earth, he was able to quickly locate where Goku was. And here, he tells his speech that you are a Saiyan. You should be conquering these people, not being friends with them. Now, this is a pivotal point for the character because we assume that Raddus is coming from somewhere else. You see, Raddus is not told from the other Saiyans that it has to be this way. The thing about Raddus is when he does see his brother, it's not just a, hey Goku, nice to see you. It's instead, you need to follow what I say or else we're throwing hands. Now at this time, Raddus is much stronger than Goku was, so therefore he has to get help from Piccolo. And Raddus does hold his own very, very well. Matter of fact, Gohan, which is Goku's son, the new character in the series has to help out during the situation. Now he helps out more because Goku was getting pummeled at the time, but he still helped out and showed that he had that promise. This part of Dragon Ball also shows us that you don't need to have a power up to win the fight. You see, Piccolo has always had the special beam cannon that rips through skin like butter. So when they realize that the beam was actually too slow to hit Raddus, Goku decides to sacrifice himself in the situation. Now this is a great play and really is wit over bronze. And because of this incident, both Raddus and Goku are killed at the same time. Raddus is never shown again in the series, which is kind of crazy. And in a minute here, you'll find out that he's not the only one that never shows up again. But for some reason, Goku does become friends with King Kai, therefore he gets a second shot later on. I mean, this is his show, what else do you expect? Since Raddus' life is cut short here, that's really it to his story. But honestly, he was only a setup for the next characters we get to see. Now entering one of the most famous characters in Dragon Ball, Vegeta, as well as Nappa. Two other pure Saiyans coming to Earth do the same thing that Raddus was trying to do. And well, they cause a lot more havoc than Raddus ever did. You see, getting Goku out of the equation makes Gohan and Piccolo have to get stronger. Now, Gohan wasn't even a fighter at the time. However, he needed to learn just in case his dad was gone. And this is also the chance we get to see old characters re-enter into the story, such as the Z Fighters. If you're a fan of the original Dragon Ball series, then seeing characters such as Tien, Chaozu, and Yamcha is a great thing to have. The problem is these characters are for sure outdated. So they do get their chance to do a couple of things against the Cybermen that Nappa spawns, but shortly after, Nappa really embarrasses the Z Fighters. I'm talking about cutting off Tien's arm and exploding Yamcha. It felt just so disrespectful. And on top of that, they also had a moment that Piccolo had to sacrifice himself to save Gohan. Now this is one of the most memorable moments of the Dragon Ball Z series. And it's also the reason why people say that Piccolo is actually Gohan's father. It's not true, but sometimes it feels like it. Overall, the Z fighters are just here to be the wait until Goku arrives team. And while that is sad, if you are a Z fighters fan, Goku eventually arrives to save the day. Now when Goku finally arrives, this is the point that he embarrasses Nappa, showing that he is much, much stronger than Nappa ever was. Even doing cool poses such as holding up his whole body with just one hand. Now I would not say that Nappa was a throwaway character, especially what he did to the Z fighters. However, for some weird reason, Vegeta believes he is and chooses to kill his own partner. This right here is a moment that makes absolutely no sense. What's the purpose of killing Nappa when he's not even going against you? Don't forget he also obliterated the whole Z Fighter crew. 
Was it just a reason to flex? I honestly don't get it. Nonetheless, this leads into one of the biggest fights we've seen from the Dragon Ball Z series, which is Goku against Vegeta. Now I'm gonna emphasize this fight the most I can because the fights between Goku and Vegeta are really fan anticipated fights. In this fight specifically, you're seeing a Saiyan raise on Earth that has the ability to use Kaioken. On the other side, Vegeta is the quote unquote bad Saiyan that has the ability to turn into a great ape and use that transformation. If we ever get a reanimated series for Dragon Ball Z, this fight would be one of the best. And even having attacks such as Kamehameha versus Galagun is really cool. That being said, you could argue in this fight that Vegeta was technically stronger than Goku. Goku really won because he had the help of Yajirobe and Krillin. Krillin having the ability to destruct Odis that can cut through anything, and then Yajirobe being smart enough just to cut off Vegeta's tail. Now, Vegeta using his great ape ability showed that he knew more about Saiyans than other characters do. Now, let me rephrase that because every character knows if a Saiyan has his tail, he can go to a great ape form. However, Vegeta was able to control his great ape form and also was able to turn Gohan into a great ape. Vegeta specifically knew that he could control his form and Gohan could not control his. You could say that the great ape form is a power up for sure for Vegeta, but it's for sure not for Gohan, especially when friendly fire could happen at any moment. But after the teamwork of Goku, Krillin, Gohan, and Yajirobe, Vegeta is defeated. And Vegeta also gets away going back through his space pod. Now you could ask as a viewer, was it a mistake not to kill Vegeta at the end of this arc? I would personally say no, knowing what he does in the future. But this now concludes one of the best arcs of Dragon Ball, the Saiyan Saga arc. Next, we'll be leading to some people's favorite arc, the Planet Namek Saga arc. Now leading into the Planet Namek Saga arc, this show is called Dragon Ball for a reason. Gohan, Krillin, and Boma all go to Planet Namek to collect their Dragon Balls. The reason being is if you get these Dragon Balls, you can grant your own wish. And the plan was to wish your friends back from death. Don't forget characters such as Chaozu, Yamcha, even Piccolo were all killed during the last arc. So instead of just waiting for Goku to get recovered, which really doesn't make sense, they choose to go by themselves. Maybe assuming that there was not going to be an antagonist group there, however, there was. Now entering Lord Frieza and the Frieza clan. Now when it comes to Frieza, this character is a true tyrant. A character that really wants to take over different places because he can. And also Frieza is the young prince of the Frieza clan. Hence why the Frieza clan is named after him. Along with Frieza, we'll see a lot of other characters accompany Frieza, such as Zarbon, Doria, and the Ginyu Force. The thing is, this place is also home to Namekians. That's the same race that Piccolo is, a Namekian from Namek. And well, we'll see how they get involved with this arc. Now going over the first part of the Namek saga, there's a whole lot that goes on. Frieza is here with his henchmen to do anything he can to get the Dragon Balls first. And that includes if you have to take out other Namekians in the process. Now at the same time, we also have our main hero cast, Boma, Krillin, and Gohan looking for the Dragon Balls. And here for the plot, we have Vegeta looking for the Dragon Balls for his own sake. You can assume that Vegeta is working with the other three heroes, even though he acts like he's not. During the beginning part of this arc, Goku has still not arrived at Namek. So it's up to our main hero cast not only to find the Dragon Balls and keep them away from Frieza, but also to beat the other enemies that show up. And there's a whole lot of fights that happen during this time. Vegeta has a lot of memorable moments such as fighting against Adoria, at which he does win, but right after he's torn to bits by Zarbon's awakened form. Throughout this arc, Vegeta also preaches that a Saiyan can get stronger if he continues to lose. It's a weird way to ignore your L and say you'll be back stronger than ever. And I guess he does do that multiple times throughout the arc. Besides Zarbon and Adoria, we also get introduced to another group. Could you say that this group is technically stronger than those two? Possibly. But regardless, we're now introduced to the Ginyu Force. Ginyu, Jace, Birder, Raccoon, and Guldo all make up this team. And our main cast wasn't really strong enough to beat one of them. Even Krillin and Gohan had to gang up against Gordo to do anything. And this is also after the incident that our Namekians gave them both a power boost. Now this power boost is technically an awakening at which they can unlock their hidden potential. I say that Krillin does not get a lot out of this compared to Gohan, but that's also probably because Gohan's a hybrid Saiyan and younger. But as I just said, even though they got these power ups, it was not enough to beat Raccoon. And Raccoon does Gohan pretty dirty. This moment also probably foreshadows what happens to Gohan later on in the future. Regardless, it's now time for Goku to enter the fray and save everyone from disaster. 
Once Goku arrives, he easily no diffs Raku. And I wish he kind of stood more on business to say, hey, did you do this to my son? I'm gonna do you much worse. But I honestly don't know if Goku cares about his son. Regardless, Goku puts the other Ginyu Force in their place pretty quickly, except when it comes to Ginyu. Ginyu has a secret ability, which is a body exchange. Using this ability, he's able to swap his soul into someone else's body if he hits it. And well, this gave him enough of an upper hand to actually beat Goku because he's in Goku's body. Another thing about the ability is if you take damage in the original body, whoever swaps into it will still be damaged. So could Goku have actually beaten his original body if he was not hurt? There's a possibility. But regardless, he has to rely on the others to get his body back, which does happen not too much longer later, and because of their teamwork, they're able to switch Ginyu into a frog. During this moment, this is the end of Ginyu, which kind of sucks. I'd say Ginyu had a lot more going for him compared to the rest of the team, but regardless, the Ginyu Force did have their time to shine. And because of this moment, eventually later on, the team gets to finally have their wish and bring back Piccolo. Once Piccolo is brought back to life, he's instantly sent to Nami. And here he can help out with the fight to beat Lord Frieza. Now, if you know anything about Frieza, you know he has a lot of forms. With Frieza's henchmen out of the way, it's finally time to have the main course. First, we get the chance to introduce Piccolo back into the scene. Once they revive Piccolo, he shows off a new Namekian ability where he can fuse with other Namekians. I didn't talk about the character Nail too much because most of the time he was getting bullied by Frieza and other characters. However, Piccolo chooses to fuse with Nail, making him a stronger Namekian. This is important because we see other Namekians continue to do this in the future. Anyway, as I mentioned before, now it's time to go fight Frieza. Now with Goku currently out of commission, the others get to throw their fists first. The thing is, Frieza is really the first character in the Dragon Ball series that shows off multiple transformations. Frieza's first form is pretty scrawny and small. However, when Frieza goes into second form, it's very bulky. Matter of fact, Frieza's second form is so bulky he was able to do away with Krillin in an instant. Gohan couldn't do anything against the second form of Frieza, and also Vegeta was too shook. They had to rely on the Super Namekian to come back and help. Now Piccolo fighting against Frieza shows why a lot of the fans like Piccolo. He's always ready to throw down and doesn't really need a reason to do so. And to up the ante, Frieza also shows off his third form, which looks very inappropriate, just to make it even harder on the Super Namekian. The whole team trying to jump Frieza honestly didn't really work. And once Frieza enters his last form, it gets kind of brutal. Luckily enough for us, the brutality was specifically on Vegeta. And I mean, he is the character that says, if you lose, you come back stronger, so he wanted this smoke. I'd argue that Frieza did move off of his second and third form pretty quickly and probably didn't need to. But again, for another time within the series, we're waiting for Goku to return. Once Goku returns, he sees Vegeta beaten to a pulp, so now it's his turn to fight the final form of Frieza. Now this form of Frieza is supposed to be the quote-unquote true form of Frieza, and this becomes Frieza's base state in the future. And this form of Frieza is still stronger than Goku once he returns. Now, if you've ever watched Dragon Ball, you probably know that these fights last forever. So while you're seeing these cuts within a couple of minutes, these fights actually last a long time within the anime. Which is fine if you don't mind the fights, especially because the Goku versus Frieza fight is really iconic. Now, you may be wondering what makes it iconic. Well, this is the first time we see a Super Saiyan transformation. After Frieza kills Krillin, Goku gets so angry that he turns into a Super Saiyan. This is the legendary form that both Frieza and Vegeta talk about throughout the whole series. This Super Saiyan form is supposed to be achieved by a Saiyan once they become very angry. And once Frieza killed Krillin, that was enough for him to hit this transformation. Now that does change later on once we get to the Dragon Ball Super anime. But for now, we get to see Goku become the first Super Saiyan of the series. And once he becomes a Super Saiyan, this new form is stronger than Final Form Frieza as well as Full Powered Frieza. And that's pretty nice because he didn't have to transform again to beat the Full Powered Frieza form. Now again, this fight goes on for many episodes, but at the end of the day, once the fight is completed, Frieza decides that he can't actually beat Goku. So for Frieza's sake, if he's not able to beat Goku, the best play is to now destroy the whole planet. It was a smart play from Frieza because multiple things could have happened. It's true that he could have died in this situation, but he also could have killed Goku. But it also gives him a chance to live instead of Goku just beating his butt all day. Now after this event, this is the true end of the planet Namek saga. The characters that live get off the planet as soon as possible so they can continue to live their lives. And plus technically, Vegeta 
Vegeta is now number one by his means, so he likes to bully anyone that he could. But that wraps up the end of the Planet Namek Saga. So now that we're halfway through, if you do like this video, I would greatly appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button or if you even hit the like button. We have two more Z arcs to go over, so let's start rolling. Now after a small time skip between the Planet Namek Saga, we roll into the Android Saga. Now really, this is three different arcs put into one with the Future Saga, the Android Saga, and the Cell Saga. But just assume that they're all together because they play a huge role within what happens. To start off, we're introduced to Trunks, specifically Future Trunks. Now Future Trunks shows up by saying that he is not from this timeline. And he also taunts on Vegeta as well as Frieza and King Cole that he is a Super Saiyan. Now as I mentioned before in a previous arc, Frieza did live and he became Mecha Frieza. And to get revenge, he had to go get his dad to help him out. Now Future Trunks is not here, nor does he care about Frieza. He's actually here to find Goku so he could tell him about the imminent threat. So to show that he actually means business, he quickly disposes of King Code and Mecha Frieza. And while doing so, he was willing to show that he is a Super Saiyan. The same blonde glowing hair that's now going to give Frieza nightmares. Doing this proves to the others that he's here for a good cause and doesn't want to harm them. Shortly after, we're shown that Goku did survive and he's just been training this whole time. Trunks not only tests his metal to make sure he's ready for the threat, but also asks him to take a medicine because he could die from a heart virus. Now listen, we all know Goku, he will eat anything that you want. However, when it comes to him taking medication, that's a completely different story. So while Future Trunks is trying to get the team ready for the imminent threat, we're now introduced to that group, the androids. Specifically, Android 19, as well as Android 20 slash Dr. Jero. Android 19 and 20 start their mission off by catching Yamcha lacking. And here we're hit with another sad moment for the Yamcha fan. They quickly wreck the city and kill Yamcha to let people know that they are here. So now all of the Z fighters have to get ready to go fight the androids and Goku's turn comes up first. If you ignore Yamcha, that is. Jump into the time that the team finally sees Android 20 and 19, it's time for Goku to fight. But as you can assume, Goku never took the medicine that Trunks told him to. It's just stupidity, I don't really get it. So because of this, Goku ends up having a heart virus and is not able to defeat 19. Now Android 19 also has the ability to absorb Ki. So Goku shooting off high beam Kamehameha's is not gonna do anything. Once 19 disposes of Goku pretty quickly, it's finally time for Vegeta to step in. Now we're not too sure when Vegeta achieved this, but we can assume it happened before Trunks arrived. When Vegeta steps in, he shows off that he's a brand new Super Saiyan. Vegeta also shows that he does not have to shoot off Ki Blast to win. The fight between 19 and Vegeta was really one-sided, and once Vegeta sets his sights on Jiro, it's time for him to hightail it out of here. Now once the team starts to chase after Jiro, he was not running away to save time. Instead, he was running back to his lab so he could release two other androids. Now entering the story, two of the three most important androids, 17 and 18. Now you would assume because their numbers are lower than 19 and 20 that they are weaker. But after they get rid of Dr. Jero because they don't have to listen to him, they show quickly after that they are stronger. But Cheetah still wants more time to show off that he's a true Super Saiyan. And Android 18 doesn't mind sparring with him for a bit. I should also mention that they awaken Android 16 and add him to the group as well. The difference is Android 16 is specifically looking for Goku while the other two are not. I mean, if they find him, so be it. However, that's not their main goal. Jumping back to the fight, Android 18 puts Vegeta in his place. In rewatching this fight, you'll notice that Android 18 was never trying to kill Vegeta. It could be because they were just having fun to begin with, or that was never their target. Also, these androids are a bit different than 19 and 20. Instead, 16 through 18 have an infinite amount of energy. It does seem as if Vegeta gets some hayway because Android 18 has her clothes tattered, but but because they have infinite energy, it's more like they never get touched at all. And also she breaks Vegeta's arm, which is also very embarrassing. These androids end up beating the whole team and then leave saying that they need to find Goku. After the embarrassing L that our heroes take, there's only a couple more things you could do. But first things first, Vegeta needs to go cry in the rain because you know he lost. The rest of the team decides that they need to figure out what's going on. Trunks and some of the rest of the team travel around looking for the time traveling pod that Trunks took. And well, here they find a new surprise. A large bug-like shell that seemed like it recently hatched. Psst, this is called Cell. After some time has passed, a lot of our heroes decide to do things differently. First, our Saiyans and hybrid Saiyans decide to go to the hyperbolical time chamber. This is a room at which they can get stronger without wasting time. Basically, time just goes immensely slow within this room. On the other hand, Piccolo decided to fuse the Kami because 
because Nameki Infusion is boss. With his new power up, he decides to go fight 17. However, this is a very weird position because Piccolo also fought Cell a little bit earlier. It's difficult because there's multiple factions you're supposed to go against such as Cell and then the androids. And then also Cell is looking for the androids. But you know, Big Brain Piccolo decides this is the best time to throw hands with 17. And because of this fluke, Cell decides this is the best time to capture the androids lacking. Cell has been looking for specifically Android 17 and 18 to power up himself. Using this whatever this tube like thing is, he's able to capture 17 and absorb him. Being able to absorb him completely makes him transform into the second form of Cell. Now a question I do have is why doesn't Cell want Android 16? It is true that Android 16 is completely mechanical, but in that case Android 17 and 18 being part human makes you believe that it's the human part of them. And if that's the portion that you wanted, then why are you not just absorbing everyone? I don't know, man. Very, very weird. Anyways, Sale's second form is now out, and Tien comes around just in time to save the day. And by help out, I mean shooting off some of those high tribeam blasts just to prolong the inevitable. Which is still better than what he did in the Saiyan Saga, I can at least tell you that. Because second form Cell is now out and he's much stronger than the other characters, it's time for Vegeta and Future Trunks to return to the story. But now both characters have had some time to power up within the chamber. Trunks looks the most different because his hair changed along with him being in there for a long period of time. And Vegeta, I don't know, he's still missing some. Both characters go directly towards second form Cell to test their metal. The thing is now they both have a new Super Saiyan transformation. This new transformation for both characters is called quote unquote Super Vegeta or Super Trunks. It's not really a true evolution compared to just bulking up your muscles. However, Super Vegeta is always ready to talk that trash. And actually he does a pretty good job beating down second form Cell. Where he sold is that he wanted to test his metal by having a stronger opponent. Therefore he was willing to let second form Cell go and find Android 18 to reach his perfect form. Now Trunks not only has to stop Cell, but he has to stop his dad too. Just a terrible, terrible fate. These Saiyans do not think. And on the other hand, Krillin knew he was out of the story to begin with, so he had a self-destruct device that could destroy Android 18. However, he's so infatuated because she's the baddest of bads, he couldn't do it. And as you can assume, Android 18 is eventually absorbed, which looks much worse than Android 17 did. But this now introduces the final form of Cell. With Cell's new body, he quickly puts down the others, especially Vegeta who talked big and bad. Trunks did do his best showing off his super form trying to fight Cell, but it didn't matter. No one else is strong enough to beat Cell and the best chance you had was Super Vegeta. But all you Vegeta fans, you know exactly how he is. We also get a short flashback showing what Trunks' timeline was like. Back in the day, he did not have a Cell that he had to fight again. However, his timeline did have 17 and 18, which was enough to defeat him and future Gohan. So Trunks is realizing that maybe he failed with this timeline too with just a different way. But nonetheless, Cell does give them some mercy because he's a man of the craft. Instead of just killing off the Z fighters here, he would instead like to have something called the Cell Games. A situation in which most characters can participate and you get your own chance to fight Cell. It's a way for him to have a fair fight within the ring. Now to be quite honest, I don't get the reason as to why Cell wanted to do this. Could it be his Vegeta pride that just wants to be the strongest and it gets to him? Maybe. But once Goku and Gohan return from the hyperbolic time chamber, you see that Gohan is a Super Saiyan. Plus, both characters are purposely staying within their Super Saiyan form. At this current point of the story, there's nine more days until the Cell game starts. And both characters would prefer to train outside instead of going back into the chamber. And to each their own for sure, but we know that Vegeta needs to get his ass back in there right now. Now then finally, we're getting to the climax of this arc. The Cell games begin and we're first introduced to Hercule. Mr. Satan is supposed to be the strongest fighter in the universe, the world's martial artist, da 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 da. When we're introduced to Mr. Satan, he's supposed to be a joke character. And Hercule for sure gets his chance to fight Cell. It's just Hercule has more of an importance into the next arc compared to this one, so why not introduce him here? Next on the list is finally time for Goku to fight Cell. And for what it is, Goku does a very good job fighting Cell. Some pretty cool important moments here, such as him doing the instant transmission Kamehameha. However, Goku also admits that he 
is not strong enough to beat Cell. As a viewer, we're shown that he quits pretty prematurely and he doesn't have too many scratches on his face. But truth be told, he also had another agenda to do this fight. Goku was never going to beat Cell and he never planned to. Instead, his plan was to see if Gohan was able to keep up with what he was doing. He goes back to Gohan and asks him if he's able to keep up with the fight he just saw. And then he publicly gives up saying that Gohan is the one that's going to fight Cell. Now for most of us, this is a very foolish play, but it gets much worse because then Goku decides to give Cell a Sensu Beam. Now why would you give Cell a full heal? Of all of the dumb moments in this series, and I'm sure Vegeta's had plenty of them, this one might be the worst. It's for sure one thing to fight fair, but it's another thing to fight stupid. Putting Gohan in at this moment was probably for the best. However, fully healing the opponent is a completely different story. But regardless, it's now time for Gohan to fight against Cell. Gohan does what he can to fight against Cell within his Super Saiyan form. But that's not the highlight because soon after, Cell decides to do something dirty. Realizing that he probably can't keep it up, he decides to summon Cell Juniors, smaller versions of himself, which is not equal to him dividing his own strength. And these Cell Juniors are actually pretty strong. I mean, strong enough that they're giving the other Super Saiyans such as Trunks and Vegeta the work. You knew Yamcha and Tien were not about to beat them anyway, but the other Saiyans losing to them was more important. 16 does his best realizing that maybe if he uses his self-destruct mode, he can kill Cell in one blow. However, the consequences of his actions causes him not to only be beheaded, but also killed. Now it's true that 16 is a machine. However, we realize that he was learning to be quote unquote human. And this struck a nerve in Gohan to probably have one of the most memorable moments for his character ever. Once 16 gives his speech and is eventually destroyed, Super Saiyan 2 Gohan now emerges. And this moment here is where the fight really kicks in. Super Saiyan 2 Gohan was so strong, he was able to dispose of the Cell Juniors in which the others could not. This form is a true awakening for a Super Saiyan compared to what Super Trunks and Super Vegeta were. The problem the problem with the Super Saiyan 2 form is Gohan becomes more cocky to the point that he realizes he would rather play around with Cell instead of killing him. Due to this cocky nature that Gohan had, this causes a lot more issues than we'd expect. The first one being is that Cell actually was able to kill Goku. Now how this happened is more of a workaround because Cell believed the best way you can win is to explode the earth. And since they weren't able to kill Cell within that time and he was a bomb, the best thing Goku could do is instant transmission him to somewhere else. And while doing so, he got caught by the blast and died. But the reign of Cell did not end here because he is a Cell. Because of the situation, a speck of him lived and he was able to regenerate. And because he has Saiyan Cells, he's now able to become a true perfect Cell. When Perfect Cell returns back to Earth, he's now able to shoot a death beam in two future trunks. And this beam puts future trunks out of commission completely. I mean, he's just done for the fight. So now Gohan realized that the only thing you can do to beat Cell is to defeat him within one blast. So now entering another memorable attack, the father-son Kamehameha. Here is basically Goku kind of transmitting his energy to help Gohan do a one-armed Kamehameha. At first, this Perfect Form Cell was still stronger than Gohan was. However, Dragon Ball made another big brain play and used the other Z Fighters. The other Z Fighters decided to go behind Cell and shoot Ki Blast at his back. And once it was an opportune time, Gohan was able to use all of his power he could muster and defeat Cell. And you know, this fight was very satisfying. It's hard to say which fight was better between Goku and Frieza and then Cell and Gohan. But regardless of which one you prefer, Gohan is now supposed to be the new protector of Earth. And this concludes the Android slash Cell saga. Now then, this video has been pretty long, but we have one more saga to go over. So again, kick back and get ready for the final arc, which is the Boo Saga. Now then, rolling into the Boo Saga, we're introduced to another time skip. This time, the world's been a little bit more peaceful than before. Gohan has been homeschooled by Chi Chi this whole time, and now he wants to join a public high school. But don't get it twisted, while he is working to become something more than just a fighter, he is still ready to throw down. Whenever regular criminals show up, Gohan's always the first one to be there and to put them down. And plus, he is still a Super Saiyan, so he's at a higher notch than these other characters can ever be. However, there's another hero of justice running around named Videl, the daughter of Hercule, at which we saw from the last arc. Videl's a bit different compared to her old man because she's actually willing and can fight. And when she first meets Gohan, she doesn't realize that he's solving a lot of these issues. To protect his own identity, Gohan decides to become the great Saiyan man. Now this is not a factual truth, however, I do believe this is because of the Ginyu Force. 
If you remember in the Planet Namek saga, the Ginyu Force were supposed to be quote unquote heroes. And because what they did at Gohan at such a young age, I wonder if the Great Saiyan Man is a reflection off of the Ginyu Force. Regardless, he makes the Great Saiyan Man his persona. However, they find out the truth of who he actually is later on. Now, Videl decides to blackmail him because of this. And she realizes the best thing she can do is get some training from someone that's that strong. We also get introduced to two other young characters. First is Goten, which is Gohan's brother, which is odd because when did Goku have time to do this? As well as Kid Trunks, who is now a bit older from when we saw him in the Cell Saga. Now, these two characters play a pivotal role later on, especially because we see that they can become Super Saiyan. With some help from Gohan, both Videl and Goten get some valuable training from this young Saiyan. But this is because our heroes want to join the next world tournament. And surprisingly, because of the plot, Goku is sent back to Earth for one day. Why does Goku get this special treatment except for plot? I have no clue. And heck, he even got to meet his new son in which he didn't even know he created. Now the world tournament here is only a setup for the next portion. During this time, Goku and a gang get to meet the Supreme Kai. At first, the character seems to be a little bit sleazy as if he's up to no good. However, we find out during the tournament that they're looking for something. Again, if you are here for the tournament, you get a couple of good fights such as Goten versus Kid Trunks. But the real fight starts when Videl is against Muscle Man. During this fight, Videl actually gets took in front of everyone. And it's worse because most people are willing to watch what happens. Now from the audience, what were they going to do against him anyway? But from our hero's perspective, it was all a plot to get Gohan angry. They assumed the possessed Majin characters were looking for Gohan's power. So they not only let Gohan get took so he could get angry, but once it was his turn to fight Kabito, they willingly held him down so he could get his power drained. I mean, come on y'all, what is this? Why don't you just follow him? The reason this part doesn't make a lot of sense because they wanted to go follow the characters back to their lair, and they for sure do it, but why didn't you just wait for them to go back anyway? I don't know, man. I really don't get it. At this point of the story, the heroes chase the villains to find two new bigger villains, at which we see Deborah, the king of demons, as well as Bobbity, the wizard looking dude. We are greeted with a small confrontational fight, but it went the way you expect it to. Honestly, this was a bit more disrespectful than the usual fight. Deborah literally spits on both Piccolo and Krillin, turning them to stone. They probably could have done anything else like shooting a laser beam or like even a key blast, but no, he spits on them like they're nothing but dirt. So now we have our Saiyans that have to go save the day and follow Bobbity. We have multiple fights here in which Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan all take their turns fighting. Honestly, the big biggest fight here was Gohan getting to fight against Deborah. This fight kind of shows us that Gohan has not been training and is actually weaker than he was back in the Cell Saga arc. Nonetheless, it really doesn't matter because Vegeta needs the attention. Using the Majin abilities, Bobbity does his best to get inside Vegeta's mind and honestly, I think he lets him. Because of this, we're introduced to a new form of Vegeta, one that is a fan favorite, Majin Vegeta. Majin Vegeta is basically Super Saiyan Vegeta with an M on his head and a lot of veins. And supposedly, he's supposed to be controlled by Bobbity, but how much of that is true, I'm not too sure. Regardless, being considered Majin or evil was the best thing that could have happened for Vegeta. Because of this, he's able to now fight Goku, and Goku has to fight him because he's killing people. The Supreme Kai did his best to stop this needless fight, however, eventually he just has to let it happen. So now we're treated with another fan anticipated fight with Vegeta versus Goku. Now, overall, this fight was pretty good, but it's pretty clear that these characters were not going all out. I'm sure that Vegeta still has some sense, and he actually didn't want to hurt Goku too bad. And plus, Goku was hiding something else this whole fight anyway. Meanwhile, at the same time, the main villain of this arc is finally born. Thanks to Bobbity doing his magic wizard crap, Boo is born. Now, when it comes to Boo, it's hard to say that he is necessarily evil. Boo goes through a lot of different transformations throughout the Boo saga, so it's hard to say which one is actually sentiment. But for example, Fat Boo, he really only does things that please him or he may seem as fun. For example, whooping Vegeta's butt. Now, at this moment, we all assumed that Vegeta was stronger than Goku because he won the fight. But Boo quickly embarrasses Vegeta, which is honestly not a shocker, and Vegeta ends up doing a final explosion, hoping that Boo would be killed in one shot. Now honestly, this part is supposed to be sad, especially seeing Vegeta hug Kid Trunks at the end. However, this is the main villain of the arc, and Vegeta should never get a win. Boo quickly puts himself back together, and it's time for him to do what he wants to do. So at this point, it's time for our other heroes that are still alive to start training. Hopefully they can beat Boo. Gohan is with Kabito and Supreme Kai, hoping he can get stronger using their power. Goku realizes that Kid Trunks and Goten are stronger than most people are at this age. So he sets them up with Piccolo to do some special training. And then meanwhile, it's now Goku's turn to go fight Fat Boo. 
Now this is what I was referring to before, that Goku might have had something else up his sleeve. When he gets the chance to go fight Fat Boo, he instantly goes Super Saiyan 3. Now there is no way he learned this form between the fight he had with Vegeta till now. So it's clear to us as viewers that he always had this form, he just didn't want to use it against Vegeta. During this fight, it's a great way for Goku to see how strong Fat Boo actually is compared to his best. After a quick sparring match, Goku returns to train Kid Trunks and Goten. Teaching them the fusion dance to combine their power together is the best way to do it. After a couple of fails, eventually the new fusion Gotenks is born. Gotenks is very, very cocky. He even tried to go fight Fat Boo only in his base state instead of training more. During the first time, we see that Gotenks' base form is clearly not strong enough, so eventually they have to go Super Saiyan. Once Trunks and Goten both go Super Saiyan and then fuse, this next now makes Super Saiyan Gotenks. In the meantime, we also need to point our eyes towards what Fat Boo is doing. As I mentioned before, Fat Boo isn't necessarily a bad character. And we see throughout this series and multiple times, he actually does have a heart. An example that really affects the plot is when he sees a dog that is injured. Fat Boo was able to heal this dog back to health and instantly the dog is happy about it. Even Hercule, who was immensely scared of Fat Boo, was willing to be around him because of his kind heart. However, there are still people out there just like the real world that do dirty, dirty things. And because of this, Evil Boo is born. Evil Boo is a true true villain, a Majin character that only has nothing but hate in his heart. Now Evil Boo and Fat Boo slash Good Boo have their own fight, and eventually Evil Boo ends up winning out causing a change reaction. Once Evil Boo turns Fat Boo into candy and eats him, he now becomes Super Boo. So this is basically Evil Boo with a pink tint from Fat Boo, but he's called Super Boo. Anyways, he instantly flies up to the rest of the cast and decides he needs to fight someone now. And to show that he means business, he decides to hit everyone on Earth with an attack. So now our heroes have to force their hand to give Super Boo what he wants, which is a fight against Gotenks. Now the boys have been inside the hyperbolic time chamber this whole time, so Boo does get his fight. And I will say the fight between Super Boo and Gotenks is very enjoyable to watch. Gotenks has a lot of different abilities that he can use. And plus, Gotenks never takes the situation too seriously. So during the fight, we're shown base Gotenks as well as Super Saiyan Gotenks, which is not strong enough to beat Super Boo. However, a hidden trick up his sleeve he has is Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks. They learn this after watching Goku do it, so within their few state, they can do it too. And Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks was technically stronger than Super Boo. However, shortly after, we also see that Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks could not keep his form, causing the boys not only to go back to their base state, but also to defuse. So now this is the end of Gotenks and we're now greeted with the next character, Gohan. Now for all the Gohan fans out there, you notice that he never goes Super Saiyan during this fight. Similar to when he had his potential unlocked back in the Planet Namek Saga, this is similar to what happened back then. This form is called Mystic Gohan or Full Powered Awakened Gohan, whatever you want to call it. And to start off, he was doing very well against Super Boo. However, we have not forgotten that Super Boo has the ability to absorb others. He quickly uses that ability against both Gotenks and and Piccolo. The first form we see after the absorption is Boo Tanks, which is basically Super Boo wearing the swaggy vest that Gotenks has. And this form of Boo takes down Gohan pretty easily. Once Gohan is not able to defeat Boo, it's time for Goku to step in. However, the Kais were able to give him their earrings, which can cause fusion. Instead of having to do the fusion dance that Kid Trunks and Goten had to do, you just had to put on the other earring. And Gohan actually doesn't catch his earring. So Goku has to do his best to wait out the time for Gohan to find the said earring. And even when Gohan finds the other earring, it's too late because Super Boo decides to absorb Gohan. Now there's also a change with this Super Boo because he's able to talk. Because he was able to absorb characters such as Piccolo, he now has some type of intelligence. And once he becomes Buhan, it's kind of doomed for Goku. So now that we have Gohan currently out of the fight, Vegeta's turn is coming up next. Vegeta gets the free day pass that Goku had to return to the world of the living. However, the plan now is to make sure both Goku and Vegeta fuse together. At first, Vegeta is very stubborn as always, not realizing the shape they're currently in. But after getting clapped a little bit, he finally decides it's time to put on the earring, and now we're introduced to the new fusion, Vegito. Now while Vegito is a fusion of both Vegeta and Goku, Vegeta is the one that stands out of this fusion. The cockiness of the character as well as playing around with your food is just something that all these Saiyans have. And it stands out the worst with Vegeta. Not to mention, Vegito also has the ability to go Super Saiyan. So as soon as Super Vegito comes out, it shows that he is the strongest character in the series we've seen. The problem that's waiting to show its ugly face is, this is a fusion and it does not last forever. Eventually while trying to get the rest of the team out 
out of Boo, Goku, and Vegeta defuse. Now they're successful getting the rest of the team out such as Piccolo, Gohan, and Gotenks. However, the fusion now does not work and now they're back in their base state. Plus, we're now introduced to the final transformation of Boo, which is Kid Boo. People have argued time after time again if Kid Boo or Boo Han is actually stronger. You can let me know in the comments down below what you think, however, they're both stronger than Goku and Vegeta at this point. While this fight has been going on for many episodes, we get a couple more with Super Saiyan 3 Goku and Super Saiyan 2 Vegeta against Kid Boo. I'd also say this is probably another memorable fight, however, there's plenty of them within the Boo saga. Kid Boo also now does not have the ability to talk. We assume that this is the original form of Boo, and also he's just pure evil. So now our heroes have to rely on getting the spirit bomb to hopefully defeat Boo. Now after a lot of other things go on, such as using Vegeta as a punching bag, or bringing back the people that were killed in this past arc, everything was set up specifically for Goku to use the spirit bomb. And we see many characters that we've seen throughout the series give their energy to help the spirit bomb. And I will say using the spirit bomb technique felt much better than using the Kamehameha. And because of the spirit bomb, eventually Kid Buu is defeated and the earth is saved. We're also treated with many episodes at the end showing what the characters are doing after the defeat of Kid Buu. And an important thing to notice is that Evil Buu is reborn into Oob, which is also a wish that Goku had while defeating Kid Buu. And well, that concludes the arc of the Buu saga as well as Dragon Ball Z. This was a long one, and plus we only went over the main arcs of Dragon Ball Z. But depending on how this video does, maybe we'll come back for the original Dragon Ball, Super, or something else. But for now, let me know in the comments down below what your favorite arc of Dragon Ball Z is. And if you stay with me all the way, I want to say thank you guys for the love and support on Patreon. Everything matters and I greatly appreciate it. And since you're here for Dragon Ball, I have another one for you to watch over here. Thank you all for watching. Until next time, take care.